We will be in Isaiah chapter 9 this morning. We're going to look at several different scriptures, and I'd like for you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. And I'll have to, I have to admit this, I've, uh, well, first of all, thank you to, to Steve Dennis for filling in last Sunday. I was not feeling quite well, and I went to the doctor, and uh, prednisone will make things blurry, I guess, in some people, if you take it. And so really beyond 10 feet, everything's blurry. So just let me say to the 861 that are in front of me and the thousands upon thousands on Facebook that I see, uh, welcome and glad that you're here. Well, that's just a joke, by the way. I don't uh, have that big of a problem, but um, I do have uh, uh, a little bit of struggle with that this morning, so you'll bear with me, hopefully. Um, we're going to think about this morning the Prince of Peace. What would you expect us to talk about this morning? Well, really, what would you expect us to talk about any Sunday morning that you're here, right? Jesus. True? So uh, let's take a look at this, this idea. Well, it's what God is delivering to mankind. It's what we, we have experienced and can experience if we would like peace and the prince of it. Isaiah 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. When those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before, before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning with uh, will be fuel for fire. For to us, a child is born to us. A son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting father. Prince of peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, I love the fact that if God's going to accomplish something, he is going to accomplish it. You're just not going to stop him. You remember what Gamaliel said in, in, uh, in the book of Acts. You're going to be fighting against God if, if God's the one that's doing this. And so if God sets out to do this, he's going to do it. And guess what he's setting out to do? He's setting out to save you. To bring you peace. Because you and your natural state, the way it is after Adam and Eve sinned and we have sin in the world and we are all sinners, as Scripture tells us, that's what we have to offer. That comes in, it severs, it damages the relationship that we would otherwise have with God. And we don't, we can't walk with Him and hold on to our sin. And so God sends this Prince of Peace to make peace because otherwise we would be Children of wrath because of the sin that is in us and with us. And he seeks to save us. Church, that's a good thing, isn't it? Aren't you glad that he sent this wonderful Savior to us? Isaiah 26, 12 says, Lord, 
You establish peace for us. You're the one that's doing this. You know, the world is seeking peace. We even have organizations, worldwide organizations that are supposedly seeking peace, right? Wanting peace among all the nations. You know what's going to bring peace? Jesus. The Prince of Peace will bring peace. And so the world will never bring you peace. If you're looking for peace in 2020, you won't find it aside from Jesus. If you're, it's not coming in 2021 either. I can tell you that aside from Jesus. He is the prince of it. He's the prince of peace. And he's the only one that can bring it to you. So it doesn't take away all the bad things that uh, might happen or has happened or will happen, whatever it might be. It doesn't do that, but he gives you what you need to get through. And he brings us peace. So there are certain times when God intervenes in Scripture. And, and some uh, instances may come to mind as we think our way through this. But God intervenes in some situations to make sure that humans don't uh, mess it up, let's say, or disrupt his plan. You say, how can, how can someone disrupt the plan of God? Well, exactly. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. In, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 18, the heading is the birth of Jesus Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. He had in mind to do this. Now, why was Joseph going to do this? Because he doesn't want to put Mary in this situation. But how do you get her out of the situation she's already in or she's going to be? But but you're going to do this because you're going to try to make it better. You're going to fix it as best you can. And so he had in mind to do this. Look at verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is God's doing. Now, typically, um, it would be an attempt. It would be an attempt by a human being to um, maybe to do something sinful or bad. Maybe that's what we would bring to the table. It's. It's I'm going to fix this. And the fix is worse that maybe than anything you've maybe experienced that. Well, but Joseph is doing something honorable here. He's doing the honorable thing. And what does God do? God stops him from proceeding with this thought that he had. It was a good thing. And typically what we have to offer maybe are not so good things to, to, to God or to try to give him an idea of how to fix the situation, how to make it better. No, we don't want to do this. We want to make it better for Mary. So let's do this. No, no, no. So it's interesting, isn't it? That you, so you stop Joseph from doing something honorable to allow a scandalous birth to take place. Now, let think about that. Now, scandalous. All right. 
we understand what God is doing. It's not a scandalous thing, but I don't care what society you're in. I don't care what point in time you drop Jesus into the picture. You do it this way. It's scandalous. Now, right now, we could had Jesus been born in 2020. There's a reason God didn't have him born this year, right? But we could have done. Would, would there have been DNA? Would this have been on the news? I mean, would we have gotten to the bottom of this? But, you know, here's the thing. We get to the bottom of it, but we never really get to the bottom of it, do we? Who killed JFK? Where's the body of Jimmy Hoffa? I mean, right? We get to the bottom of it. This is what happened. Was there a moon landing? All right, I'm not trying to cause trouble here. Boy, that would really broke things loose. I could... See, out of the 800 and some that are here. <laughs> well, God's ways are higher than our ways. True? Isaiah 55, 9 talks about that. His thoughts are deeper, bigger, wider than ours. So we don't understand what he already knows, you might say. So the reason for all of this is found in verse 21, Matthew chapter one, verse 21. The reason for all of this, she will, this is Mary, Mary will give birth to a son. This is going to happen. No one's going to stop this. And why? This is just keeps getting better and better. She will give birth to a son and you are. You are to give him the name Jesus, he even gives the name. Because he will save his people from their sins. He is going to do this. Now, at this point, there's no way that they understand that he's going to die on the cross for our sins. Now, we have the luxury of being so far removed from this scene that we have lots and lots of things to read and and and. We've had years to contemplate this, what God has done. But here you see is Joseph. And he's trying to do something honorable. And God says, not so fast. It's going to happen this way. And I would think that this sort of cloud was over uh, Jesus and, and the family for quite some time, wouldn't you? Oh, that's just Jesus. <laughs> noble, noble birth. Yeah, king, right. More like scandal, right. Pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. There's medication for that. That would what, That's what we would do today, right? I mean, you wouldn't even hear the story. It's so ludicrous to think about. But this is what God does. And he, and he stops Joseph from doing this. And he says, no, this is going, it's going to be this way. It's going to be all right. It's going to be this way. Aren't you glad that God doesn't shrink back from doing some things that, that we might think, or, oh, well, that's a little, <laughs> that's a little, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, that might get some eyebrows raised, so let's not do that. God just says, no, we're doing this. This is the way it's going to be. There are other lessons that we could do as to why that is. We won't do that right now. There doesn't appear to be a way to bring about the birth of Jesus without disruption. This is what I want us to think about this morning. There, there appears to be no way to bring Jesus to this earth, to have him born through a woman without there being some type of disruption. Because it's not natural, right? I mean, the birth was natural and all that, but this, the way you get there, it's not. So was there any disruption to the life of Jesus? Did Jesus exist before he was born through Mary? Well, there's a lot of scripture about that. Of course he did. He didn't exist as we know him, a baby in a manger that grew up, that was crucified for us. But he surely did exist. 
You read Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, Isaiah 53 is a great read uh, if you want to think about the life of Jesus and what Jesus actually went through. Um, Isaiah does a lot of, of uh, speaking about Jesus and what God is going to do through him because of him. In Isaiah 53, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to be attracted to him. Uh, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected. He's talking about Jesus by men a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering like one from whom men hide their faces. He dis- he was despised. He was we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. And we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. For our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace, you see, was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Did it disrupt the life of Jesus? Well, if you want a peaceful, easy life, yeah. Did Jesus have to give up anything? Well, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. You know where this is going. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians 2, a very uh, famous uh, part of Scripture that deals with the life of Jesus. In uh, verse 5 of chapter 2, your attitude should be the same as of Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God Something to be grasped or something to be held onto, but he made himself nothing. Your, your version may say he emptied himself. So did it disrupt the life of Jesus? You might say, let's just, uh, I know that may not be theologically that sound to say it that way, but you understand what I'm saying. Did it disrupt anything? The emptying of himself to come to earth. He came from heaven to earth. So let's just leave that there and say, well, it did cause Jesus to have to do something, right? If he's going to willingly come to earth, he's going to empty himself. He's going to become a servant. He's going to allow himself, the king, the prince of peace, to be spat upon, to, be, to have a crown of thorn shoved on his head for them to put him on a cross that he doesn't deserve. Is that disruption if you're innocent? Okay. He's willing to go through that. Think about Mary and Joseph. Any disruption in their life to get Jesus here to this earth to save us from our sins. Any disruption whatsoever. Oh, my. (laughs) Oh, my. Sometimes I think about those two. It would be nice to just have one book about their conversations at night. Wouldn't that be... Something. So I would venture to say there was a a little bit of disruption in their lives to get Jesus to this earth. What about Herod? Herod? Are you bringing Herod into this? Well, look in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew 2, you know, Herod was, uh, he, he went after Jesus. Um, Matthew chapter two, uh, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea uh, during the time of King Herod, uh, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was what? Troubled. My version says, disturbed. And I kind of stopped there. Oh, well, okay, King Herod is disturbed. No, no doubt this, this little kid, if he grows up, if this is true, he's going to be what? King. And guess who's out? So we can't have this. But it's not just Herod. Read on. Who else is disturbed? Everybody. 
Did it did bringing Jesus to earth disrupt anything? Yeah. So what did Herod do? Okay, all the babies two. How old is how old could the kid? Okay, from two years old under, we're going to kill how many of the males? Let me ask you this. Did bringing Jesus to earth disturb those parents that lost their sons that night, that day, during that event? Now, that wasn't God's doing, right? That's evil. That's what that is. God didn't say kill them all. God just says, I'm bringing you a savior, the prince of peace. And guess what broke out? Everything but peace. Herod is disturbed along with Jerusalem. And so all the little boys, two years old and younger, you think about those families. Mm, mm -mm. Some kind of disruption there. Think about us for a moment. Our natural bent toward sin, you might say. In uh, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, Jesus is talking, whoever wants to be my disciple. Now, he's a grown man at this point, right? He's gathering disciples. He's still Prince of Peace. He's Savior. He's on his way to the cross. And he says this. I want you to think about the disruption that bringing Jesus to earth has on your life. He said to them all. Whoever wants to be my disciple. You want to be Jesus disciple? I do. Must deny themselves. Well, now that sounds like disruption to me. Because I don't like to deny myself much. Do you? I mean, let's just judge each other. I mean, you judge you. That's what I mean to say. I won't judge you. You judge you. I'll judge me. How's that? Clear as mud. So what is it that bringing Jesus to earth as a baby, having him grow up, putting him on a cross? How has that disturbed your life in any way? I love to see the manger scenes, but you know, Jesus did not stay a baby. That wasn't the purpose. You know, I found out in a lot of sporting events, I'm better than babies. I can throw a football so much further than my grandson who's two years old. I dominate when it comes to that. And playing basketball against him, I can't dunk, but he doesn't know that. Jesus didn't come for us to dominate him. <laughs> He's not a baby in a manger. He's a savior on a cross. He's the prince of peace and he lives today. He didn't stay in the manger. Aren't you glad? None of us dominate him. He asks us, should we want to be his disciples? Should we want to follow him? Would you do this? This is what it's going to take. You're going to have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow. Those three things we could spend the rest of our lives on. True. In first Peter chapter, I can't see the clock. That's my excuse. <laughs> All right. Till I have a songbook come whizzing by my head. I will not stop I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, first Peter. First Peter, chapter three. <clears throat> I, I want us to take a look at just a couple scriptures and then we're done, I promise. First Peter, chapter three. I love this because Peter has some experience. I mean, he's been with Jesus. He walked with him. He said, I'll never do this. And then he does it. I mean, Peter has some experience now. He's done some living. And he writes 
It's deep and it's rich. I want you to notice um, how Jesus is disrupting your life. Away from that natural tendency to sin. All right. So let's just look at this. Uh, First Peter, chapter three, uh, verse. Let's start in verse eight. Now, Peter's writing to Christians. And I love this because we get a lot of uh, most of the New Testament is written about how we get along, how we should live our lives in Christ. You know, so here we go. Uh, verse finally. All of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Okay, now this is the disruption, right? Someone insults you. Someone drops a sort of a snarky comment on your Facebook post. What do you do? How do you treat that? Oh, Jesus surely wouldn't be monitoring my Facebook posts, right? He surely wouldn't care about how I tweet. He surely doesn't care. Some of you are going, what are you talking about? Well, anyway, he does care because what we want to do as human beings, the natural part of us wants to do this. If you insult, I'm going to insult, right? You give evil, I'm going to give evil. You get back, you get revenge, That's a human way of thinking. Am I in the right spot? I mean, isn't that even you would never do that. You would never say that comment. You would never go after that person like that. But you may be thinking it right. It's like the little boy that his mom tells him they're they're in the worship service and he's standing up on the chair. and He says, sit down. And so he's he's. Sets down, he stands back up, sits, sit down, he sits down, and then all of a sudden he just starts grinning. Just, what are you grinning about? I'm standing up on the inside. You know, so that's the way it is sometimes with us, right? We're thinking it, maybe. <clears throat> okay. So insult for insult, don't do that, but with blessing. So someone insults you, you bless them. That's a disruption. To our natural tendencies. True? It it certainly is. Because. To this you were called. You want to be a disciple? So that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days. Must keep his tongue from evil. And his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek Peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and the ears and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for everyone who, to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And he goes on to talk about things. Verse 11 says they must turn from evil to do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. That's what Jesus came to earth to do, to show us how to live. And it disrupts the cycle of the flesh. It it really does. It upsets our apple cart, so to speak. I mean, it, it turns things inside out sometimes. Jesus is a disruptor of the flesh. Colossians chapter one. Last scripture, I promise. Colossians Chapter one, verse 15. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. The son is the image of the invisible God. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. The firstborn over all creation. 
Verse 16, for in him all things were created. Things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. The firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The father said, everything is going to be seen through Jesus. All of me, everything that I am. Is going to be, this is why Jesus makes those I am statements in Scripture, right? The book of John. Because he is God. And he's showing us God. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Do you know what? God wants you. This is why he sent Jesus. This is why Jesus in a manger. Because he wants to save you from your sin. That which you could not shake yourself loose from. He came to disturb that in you. He came to get rid of that. Satan wants you to settle into it. He wants you to snuggle up to it and say, I was just born this way. And, and it's just the way I am. It's my nature. It's, it's what I feel most comfortable with. Well, no, no kidding. Yes, of course. But Jesus, being the disruptor that he is, is not going to let you stay that way because he came to save you. Now, you can if you would like, right? You can stay that way if you would like. But God's not going to let you just skate through life without getting the scene of Jesus. And so the world celebrates during this time. A baby in a manger. Some have no idea. Some use it as an excuse for this or for that. Some use it as a religious holiday. Some do this. Some do that. You know what matters? What matters is that we see Jesus in in all settings that we see Jesus in every day of our lives. We see Jesus somewhere. God is pointing us to scripture for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself <clears throat> To himself, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now, this is how he's doing it. Look at that very last phrase there. By making peace through his blood. Well, what are you talking about? Shed on the cross. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And God saw to it that his blood was shed on the cross so that we could have peace. And so he becomes our sacrifice because we can't be our own sacrifice. He was good and perfect. He lived out what that first Adam didn't. And he became the perfect person, human being. That was God in flesh. Tell me, how much does God love you to do something like that? I'm going to do it for you. So some would say, well, then since he's done it for me, I'm just going to relax and let him do. No, no, no. Did, did, did we miss something here? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow. So this morning. Allow the Prince of Peace to bring you peace. I hope that you'll do that. This world will never, ever bring you peace. You can search for it. It'll be promised over here, promised over there. People will promise it. I'm telling you, no one brings it except Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. So let me say this to you. Merry Christmas. And consider the Prince of Peace. Maybe there's someone here this morning that that would like to be um, that person that gives themselves up, gives their, their lives over to him. 
And it's very simple. Paul talks about this in Romans 6, that we are buried with Christ. We're, we're immersed with him and we're raised to this new life so that we can live this life as a new creation. And we can live and follow Jesus. And we can be happy not only today and tomorrow, but in the days ahead. And finally, in the end, we will be with him. Why? Because we've let Jesus have our sins. So are you willing to repent of your sins, to confess him and be baptized into him this morning? If you are, won't you come? As we